would like to turn to Mark chapter 16. I'll refer to those opening verses in just a moment. This is the series for August where we're looking at these first eight verses in Mark chapter 16. I want to start with a story that some of you will have heard. Um, every time I tell it, I get quite emotional uh, because it's one of the most profound things I've heard in quite a number of years. And it concerns our dear brother Alan here. So Alan, just come and stand with me. So people on the video uh, know this, this is true. I'm not making this up. Uh, people in the church know Alan. And I'm going to tell the story because when Alan tells it, it takes a bit longer. <laughs> just come, come and stand with me. But he'll verify that this is true. So Alan was a cleaner in, a, uh, in one of the factories. And for a long time, he'd cleaned, mopped and everything, then had a pail of dirty water and threw it down the drain. Then the company had some redecoration done and they'd painted the wall and put new uh, splash boards and all sorts of things around. So when Alan came along and threw his dirty water down the drain, it splashed up the wall, didn't it? Yeah. it so the supervisor said, Alan, could you um, not do that? Could you pour it down the drain? But he'd been doing it for so long that next time he came, what did he do? Threw it down the drain and it splashed up and the they said, Alan, could you just... Uh, and it was such a habit with Alan that he was continually doing it. So the supervisor called him in and said, actually, you're on a warning. If you don't do it differently, there will be disciplinary action. And this is where the story goes. So you went home and you prayed about it, didn't you, Alan? Well, yeah. I thought I was going to be put under disciplinary. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I thought... Just come and stand here. Yeah. Because uh, the problem was, it, you had so much to do in the day that uh, not throwing a bucket of water it was a quick thing was to a do. Quick thing to do, and I've been doing it for so many years. To doing it, and I, I just found it. I needed to pray to help me to. I mean, you'd think, well, what was so hard about trickling a bottle of water down? But when you were on a time schedule and you just forget <laughs> and you've been doing it for so long and you just okay. chuck that bucket down the drain. <laughs> and what happened? And what happened? <laughs> well, I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, help me, you know. And so, how? Oh, and th the Lord said to me, I'll be there. Don't worry. So I felt like I was going to wash Jesus' feet with the water. And that helped me, because That's I knew he was going to be there waiting for me, and I'm going to pour and wash Jesus' feet in the drain, and... It worked. It worked. Brilliant. Well done. <laughs> so, that act of emptying a dirty water down a drain, the Lord said to, to Alan, do it as if you are washing my feet. That is the message this morning. Whatever you do, do it as to the Lord. So let's pick up. You say, Clive, how do you get that out of Mark 16? Very easy. This will amaze Becky again. How does he get all these? I feel quite inspired about these verses. So it begins. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on the way to the tomb. Who, how will we get in? When they looked up, that they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, row, in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Last week, I talked to you why we meet on a Sunday. The Sabbath was over. And the church gathers on a Sunday because it's the day we celebrate Jesus risen from the dead. And it says here that um, when the Sabbath was over, they went and bought spices. So this is after sunset Saturday. So markets and shops, everything gets open again. And these women go and get the spices so that they can go after sunrise to, to the tomb. 
these three women are mentioned by name. Mark 15 and verse 40 says that they had actually stood at the cross and seen Jesus crucified. And they'd followed from that place of crucifixion and they saw where Jesus had been laid. So they knew where to go and they knew Jesus was dead. So early in the morning, they go. Go to the tomb. Now, they're not grave robbers. Uh, I'll say it just in case you don't know. They're, they're not digging up a corpse from the earth. There he was laid in a, in a tomb. He was laid on a shelf cut out into the rock and that had been sealed. And they went there because they wanted to anoint Jesus because his body would be decomposing. Do you remember the story of Lazarus? After three days, he'll stink. So in that climate, the body of Jesus is going to be start decaying and decomposing. So you anoint with these spices to mask the smell. But Joseph of Arimathea had already done that. If you read in John 19, it says that Joseph took the body of Jesus and wrapped it uh, in cloths. Let me just read it. John 19 and verse 30, 38. Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. And with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by, do you remember the guy Nicodemus from the beginning of the gospel? Well, Nicodemus is there. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. My note says that's 34 kilos of spices. That is a huge amount. And uh, strips of linen. And it was a Jewish custom that they, they wrapped the body of Jesus in the cloth and covered it with these spices. They're taken... Aloes and myrrh. That takes us back to somebody else who brought myrrh, doesn't it? Some of the regal party, the, what we call the wise men, not necessarily three, but they brought gold, frankincense and myrrh, and myrrh is associated with burial. And so here is jo Joseph and Nicodemus actually covering the body of Jesus with myrrh. So why are the women going there again? Because they've seen the body of Jesus wrapped and covered. Why do they want to go themselves and do it again? Very simply, because they wanted to do something for Jesus. They wanted to do something for Jesus. Now earlier, just turn back a page in Mark 14, something like this has happened already. Mark 14 and verse uh, 1 to 8. Well, let's pick it up at verse 3. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table at the home of Simon, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard, that's an oil, she broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some of those present were indignant and said to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And Jesus says of that woman's act that she anointed him to prepare him for burial. So Jesus already can foresee his own burial, his own placing in the tomb and being anointed. He can see that he will be dead at one point. And it's a hint of the type of death he's going to die because People crucified on the cross normally didn't get anointed and wrapped in linen cloths and laid in the tomb. What 
usually happened after the body had rotted a bit, they threw it in the rubbish pit. That's why Joseph of Arimathea had to go and ask for the body of Jesus to be taken down because it was the Sabbath coming, but he wanted to, to hold on, to preserve the body of Jesus a bit and then follow the Jewish custom. And let me just emphasize that statement that Jesus made to that sinful woman. He said when she poured the expensive perfume over him, she has done a beautiful thing to me. So often Jesus was giving to others, but now here is somebody who is giving to him. And he says, that's beautiful. And that's why these women came to anoint the body of Jesus. He's wrapped in a shroud virtually, but the, the, the head is separate, it's not mummified. And they will pour the oil over the, over the head of Jesus. And basically what they want to do, they want to bless Jesus. They want to honour him. They want to give him respect. They want to thank him for all he's been for them. They want, they want to sort of share the sorrow of his departing. He was somebody who loved them and they loved him. And they felt so loved, but now he's dead. They want to do something for Jesus. And what a shock when he wasn't there. <laughs> what a shock when he wasn't there. We've prepared. We've come. Our hearts are full. We want to do something. And he's gone. <laughs> wow. They've been robbed of that experience. No wonder they left terrified and perplexed. I'm going to speculate here because we know that Jesus met with Peter personally and had a conversation with him after he denied him when, when he was questioned. Jesus met with Peter and gave him reassurance. We know when Jesus rose from the dead, uh, he met with the disciples and for 40 days he was meeting with people. Do you know, I think Jesus met with those women <laughs> and he would have said to them, Thank you. What you came to do was a beautiful thing. And I really appreciate all that you wanted to do for me. In fact, Mary goes back to the tomb. So distraught. And Jesus just says her name. In this account, we have this very simple act of women doing something which was unnecessary, but which was beautiful. And they just wanted to do something for Jesus. And that's the story. What does it teach us? As with last week, I'm giving credit to uh, an author called Beasley Murray, who wrote a, a, a part of a series the bible speaks today and it says i believe in the resurrection and he just gave a, a few sentences which inspired me on these verses this act of going to anoint the body of jesus so jesus is not here he is risen from the dead but how can we bless him today how can you bring an offering to bless Jesus, in a sense, to bring our anointing to him. How can we act in a way which is, he would say, what you've done is beautiful. I really appreciate that. Psalm 103, in my translation, the, the New International Version, uh, it's changed the word. In the older translation, uh, which I remember, Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my innermost being, bless his holy name. In the New International Version, which I've got, they say, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my innermost being, praise his holy name. They've changed bless to praise. Well, blessing is part of praise and praise is part of blessing. But I want to stick with the, the older translation. And, and the scripture says, bless the Lord, O my soul. 
And that blessing, there's a slight difference between blessing and praise. It's part of what we've done as we sung in our worship this morning. It's coming and bowing before him. It's coming and giving homage. It's an act of submission. It's an act of surrender. It's an act of recognizing who he is and my relationship with him. And so as a church, when we gather together and we sing praises to God, when we say, bless the Lord, O my soul, do you know, Jesus says, what you're doing is a beautiful thing to me. It's like you're pouring oil on my head. It's giving a fragrant offering to me. But we know worship isn't confined just to our meeting on a Sunday morning. As we sing, as we gather, as we fellowship together, that is all part of our worship. But Paul says, all of our life is worship. Present yourselves as living sacrifices, which is a reasonable, <laughs> that's a reasonable act of worship. See, Paul writing to the Colossians, he says what I, I quoted earlier. He says, Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Lord, the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do. So as Christians, we don't have a spiritual life and a secular life. We don't have a godly life and a worldly life. All of our life is an offering to Jesus. So whether you're mopping floors in a factory and pouring water down a drain, as we've done, Fiona and I have done this uh, for part of this week, we've looked after our grandchildren, which is really hard work. We're, we're exhausted at the end of that. Whether you've been serving in the hospitals, whether your day has been sitting at a computer just working out data, whether you're dealing in finance, whether you're at home, making a home, whatever you do, bring that as an offering of worship to the Lord. Say, I'm going to do this as if it was for Jesus. That will make the world a difference. And it will also help us to behave properly. Because if we misbehave if we act ungodly if we act unchristlike then we're dishonoring the name of Jesus because people should know we're Christians and and if we just get it badly wrong that's a slur on Jesus now that isn't to condemn people if we get it wrong we have an advocate with the father we can get it put right but it's not an excuse just I can be myself we need to, in our kitchen, we have a little plaque on, above the sink. And it's good to be above the sink. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> so wherever you are, in whatever situation, keep your eyes on Jesus. How he is behaving. And that is our worship. That is our worship. Jesus takes it a step further. In Matthew 25, he says to uh, his disciples, do you know you did that for me? And they said, we didn't see you there. He said, no, when, when, when you were, went and visited those in prison, when you clothed the naked, when you fed the hungry, when you housed the homeless, when you helped the refugee, when you saw your neighbor in trouble and you went and helped and supported, he said, when you did it to the least of these people, you were doing it for me. And that was a beautiful thing. As Christians, we ought to be seeing Jesus all around us and having that attitude I will pour out my life to others for him. And in the church, we have a particular opportunity to exercise that. 
That's why we did that exercise earlier. Who would you like to thank? Because when we're serving one another in the church, you're serving Jesus. You're not serving an institution. You're not serving an organization. You're not keeping the ship afloat. You're serving Jesus as you serve his body here on earth. So when you bring your offering, whatever that is, so if it is a financial contribution or you're here early on a Sunday morning or you're phoning somebody up because you're part of the Barnabas team or there's an emergency call, can somebody help? And you have that willingness to help. You are blessing the body of Christ. It's like going to the tomb, finding he's not there. What can I do with this gift? I will pour it out on his body here on earth. Let me mention my Father's Day card. Ah, dear. So it was Father's Day recently, and... Um, I always get an extra Father's Day card from somebody. I won't say who, so they don't embarrass me. I get four Father's Day cards. I've only got three children. <laughs> but this, this one was from my son, Tim. And um, I'm not going to read it out to you because it's so personal. But if you know Tim, he, he doesn't say much. But when he writes, he is so eloquent. And, and sorry. When I opened this card and read it, it touched my heart. It touched my emotions. Because he was saying things which were so deep and so meaningful to me. And when we express our heart to Jesus, he is moved. He has emotions when his people bless him. It touches God's heart. And he says, that was a beautiful thing you did for me. I really appreciate that. That touched me so deeply. Now I want to say a final word. Because this story talks about women going. When the men went, they were all in a fuddle and confusion. And, oh dear, what on earth is going on here? But the women went to do something for Jesus. And it, as a general, I'm being very general here, sometimes women find it easy to express their emotions than men do. But you know, when Jesus was with his disciples, he was with men. And Jesus said to those men, I've loved you. And it talks about some of the disciples. And they, they loved Jesus. And can I say to the men of the church, you can express your emotions. You can express your emotions in worship. You can be moved because Jesus is moved and he was a man on earth. And men, we can say we love Jesus. And in the context of today's society, we can say men, we love one another. That isn't sexual attraction. We need to reclaim what love really is. It's the giving of ourselves to one another. And men, in this church, we need to know how to love and how to express it to one another. We've done the safeguarding video. We need to do that correctly. We need to do that appropriately. But of the church, it said, look how these disciples love one another. And your emotions can be moved. The Holy Spirit can release your emotions. And the Holy Spirit can give us gifts to bless one another. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are. They're not for you to show off, not for me to show off. Look what I can do, look how I can pray. It's a, it's a gift of love to bless one another. So as we've looked at this scripture, these women came to anoint Jesus. We're going to take a moment as a church to bless the Lord. Thank you, man.